You're listening to the Back Home Network, presented by Homefield Apparel. And welcome back to Crimson Casking. I'm Clavio, Scott Caulfield, joining you. It is the 31st of January. Scott, we're already done with the month. Kind of hard to believe, but uh, we're about to hit that stretch. Where we I go, know. like we we we're gonna look up. It'll be the Super Bowl. Um, you know, we'll get our Taylor Swift moments. All the Swifties, but then like you literally like after the Super Bowl, so you look up. It's like oh, you know, spring training for those who remember. But it's like oh, like we have like three weeks left of the Big Ten season and the Big Ten tournament's coming. And then it's like the NCAA tournament. And then you got the Masters and IndyCar. It's like we are about to hit that stretch. Yeah, it's this is my favorite time of the year. Those yep. of you who have listened to the podcast for long enough know that like this stretch from the Super Bowl to really the Indy Five Hundred. Yep is my favorite set of sporting events and we'll see what happens with iu as part of that uh we're going to talk about obviously the game yesterday as indiana knocks off iowa a a costly victory in a bunch of ways but certainly an interesting one and we'll also talk a little bit about what we got coming up this weekend which i will start off by talking about this time for those of you who are not aware we are going to be live at the upstairs pub in bloomington I will be getting there probably around 11 a.m. I think Scott's getting there sometime sure. around the same time. We'll be there for the Penn State game. You can come up and talk with us if you want to. You don't have you're not required to by any means. Are we, are we caged animals? Like you can bring yeah, us food. Yeah. You can throw us throw us pretzel <laughs> bites. That's right. Come 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 throw like an orange at Scott and, and, and watch him eat it. No, um, but we'll be there during the game. Promising a lot for me. And then after the game, we'll have the rest of our friends from the Back Home Network joining us at Upstairs as Assembly Call will be coming in and doing their live post-game show. We'll be participating in that uh, as well. And you get a chance to meet a bunch of the folks that you hear on the network. So if you're in town or if you're coming in town for the game, um, you know whether or not you've got tickets, we'd love to see you out there. Being sponsored by Hard Truth Distillery, Indiana's largest distillery, one of my favorites. They're based over in Nashville. If you haven't been over to Hard Truth Hills, absolutely a place to go. And and their whole line of spirits is is just awesome stuff, Scott. I don't know if you've had some of their – if you've been to my tailgates, you've had some Hard Truth uh, spirits. Then I have. Then, yes, I have. Okay. Um, So, anyway, hope we see you all there. Again, we'll be there at Upstairs around 1130 And we'll be there for like the next five hours or so. So hope to see you there on Saturday as Indiana takes on Penn State. A couple of the quick notes. We are on Substack, crimsoncast.substack.com. We keep getting subscribers, which is awesome. Uh, It's a free subscription. You get your podcast delivered right to your inbox. We do have a paid option. We've been a little slow on the paid stuff this last week because I've been sick. Uh, which is a, a you know an obstacle, and and Scott's had you know his regular <laughs> tour. Yeah, what's your excuse? Is what you're you've saying? Been, but yes, you've been you've been you've been like truffle hunting. I think here lately. Um, so <laughs> maybe I'll live stream uh, that next time. I'll do a live stream should, truffle hunt for for the VIPs. I like that. Yeah. yeah, Scott truffle hunts in Baker's Corner or whatever was it Baker <laughs> Junction? I forget what it's called out there. But anyway, um, you can subscribe, help to financially support the podcast, or you can just do the free subscription. Be sure to check us out there. And just a reminder, we are brought to you by Home Field Apparel, your place to go for the finest in, in college fashions, the softest fabrics, the coolest designs. There is a new IU collection that's fixing to drop soon. I've seen it. I think you've seen it. I've seen it. Yeah, we, we can't talk about it other than to say it's awesome. Uh, I will have some some morsels to drop relatively soon, and I'm looking forward to talking to you all about that. But uh, head over to Home Field Apparel, use the code HOME23, get 15% off your first order. They've got great collections across the board. They just dropped a new Duke and North Carolina collection. Not that I'm into that kind of thing, but maybe you are. And you go to their social media. They do a great job with social media. Check them out on Instagram. Oh, I just heard the ACC is calling a foul on Home Field for getting that <laughs> close to Duke. So they, the home field one foul already. They're already, uh, home field's in the bonus. <laughs> or Duke's That's in the bonus not, on home field. Yeah, sorry, I messed that up. Home field yeah. might foul out. This is this is terrible. <laughs> uh, anyway, looking forward to enjoying all of your company, and, and hopefully we'll see you out in your home field gear at upstairs. Let's go ahead, uh, Scott, and jump right in and talk about the game last night. Uh, that was quite a contest, Indiana taking on Iowa And this was a game that Iowa was actually slightly favored in going into the game. Indiana came out and looked pretty good 
like right off the bat established a big lead and and it really looked like Iowa was going to kind of sink into oblivion at one point Indiana was on a 12 nothing run they led 31 to 15 um they led 35 to 19 but it was one of those games that it, it felt like it was cursed in a lot of ways yeah um you know Malik Renu goes down and and kind of a quasi non-contact injury never comes back we saw him on crutches at one point but he was basically gone the rest of the game and then there was that terrifying moment close to the end of the game where Xavier Johnson uh it looked like he fell and and broke something significant early reports are maybe it was not nearly that bad but it certainly looked awful and it kind of felt like between those items and Indiana squandering the lead that they had built up and Iowa even taking the lead a couple of times that this was another game where Indiana just wasn't going to measure up however despite the odds and despite the momentum, Indiana figured out a way to win this one. Uh, they get some clutch play out of Anthony Leal, who had the game of his life in an Indiana uniform. They get an incredible performance out of a very hobbled Khalil Ware, and they end up coming away with a 74-68 victory at home. Um, Scott, I mean, your overall impressions from that game, like what, what, how was it and, and what was your, what did you come away with? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was there. Um, and I'm sitting right kind of by the where Xavier went down, like right by that basket. And it, it was that was a tough hit. Um, I hope I hope he can <laughs> come back. It's just that guy's been not had good injury luck. No, I mean, expanding on a lot of the things that you talked about, you know, that was a game where it's it's frustrating because, you know, we're up like, you know, 15, almost 20 in the first half. And it's like you just know like this. I don't see us cruising to a 30 point victory. Like you just, you, you had the feeling Iowa was going to came, come back. They came back and they actually took the lead. I think it was like 65, 66. They took the lead at one point and it's like, oh God, yeah. once you cross that, that threshold, sometimes that's like almost too much to mentally come back from. You've got to give this team played hard. They, they fought through. There was a lot of moments where it could have been like, man, like I was coming back and Xavier goes down. Like you could just not saying you folded up, but you could have seen like, uh, understanding why, but you know, if I would have told you if you had, um, you know, clutch three by Gabe cups on your bingo card to win the game. I, I think a lot of people wouldn't have had that, but he came up huge. Like you mentioned, Anthony Leal had the game that I think a lot of us have been like, that's, that's what we've kind of been waiting for out of Leo. Like we know he can shoot looking to see it. His defense has really improved. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, Khalil Ware. I'm trying to see, uh, he had three blocks, but I mean, his block numbers really don't count because he gets like nine or 10 every game where, you know, like Perkins drives in and is like, oh, uh, Cleo Weller's there. I'm like, I'm going to pass it out. Like a lot of times there people were going to go up for shots, but they don't. Um, we and should call the, that, that we need a category for that. Yeah, like, like you got weird. Like, how about how about like deterrence? <laughs> deterrence. Like it, was, it wasn't a block. But he, yeah, he had like he had six deterrence in that game. Yeah. So. And, and, you know. The only solace you can take is, you know, we don't know how long Renew is going to be out. And don't take this the wrong way. Like, Renew is awesome as well. But there is a world where where playing on his own is kind of the only big guy. You could see how much court he was able to cover, how much he was able to kind of control that lane without other people, kind of other defenders being there. And that's with him obviously still being injured, not having the same kind of lateral quickness. So he's... Right. He's an absolute re revelation every, every time you see him play. Um, but ov overall, I mean, to me, it was I walked away with the toughness, the grittiness of that team to kind of, you know, get punched in the mouth three times, like two injury punch mouths. And then the, you know, getting having Iowa come all the way back and take the lead, but but still come back and and find a way to to grit that out. To me, that was a big win and really a, a must win if you're going to kind of turn this season around or at least get the season going in the direction you want it to. I mean, look, there were – it's one of those games where you, if you lose your leading scorer in Malik Renu three minutes into the game, which Indiana did, and you lose Khalil Ware – or didn't lose the Khalil Ware, but you know Khalil, Khalil Ware wasn't even sure to play. Right. And, you know, we heard before the game he was going to be on limited minutes, and you lose your starting point guard, and you're playing an Iowa team that, while, you know, not great, is, is, is certainly a functional basketball team. I mean, they just won at Michigan – um, you, that's not a great scenario regardless. And then you add in the problems that this team has had with, uh, kind of playing a full 40 minutes. We've talked about that a lot throughout the course of the year. Um, uh, but you know, what I take out of this is kind of, I, I guess kind of falls into the following buckets. 
the fact that so many people were able to step up and perform. Anthony Leal deserves all the credit in the world for coming off the bench when he had to be called, playing 20, 22 minutes in the game, which if I'm not mistaken, like you go back and look at Anthony Leal's career, he's only played that many minutes in an Indiana uniform twice. Uh, he played 35 minutes his freshman year, and then he played 22 minutes against – actually, th three times, sorry. Still, that's not yeah. very many for a guy who's been at IU as long as he has. And for him to come in having not played that much lately and shoot confidently uh, and just kind of be a calming presence on the court, I mean, it's a great moment for a guy who hasn't had the opportunity to have a lot of great moments in an Indiana uniform. He's been through a coaching change. Um, you know, that – that is one of those – it feels like every player that's in an IU uniform kind of gets at least one moment like that, and yep. for him to get that moment and really be kind of a decisive reason why Indiana wins a tight game that they might have otherwise lost is really cool to see. Yeah, no, I mean, huh. I, I, you know, wh whether it turns into, you know, we get a, this this Anthony Leal, like this moving forward, don't know. But I, I agree, it was awesome to see. But there is a world where, like, this does it, – it, it wasn't like he just – completely did something out of the norm like Leal's a good shooter like that's what he came in as right. and his shot has always looked good I think sometimes he's struggled with you know feeling comfortable taking the shot or doing it with a little bit of pressure in his face so there is a world where like this this does feel like him going three for four or three for five from three on a regular basis doesn't feel completely out of out of the realm plus you saw how how much this, you know, this is kind of where everyone's been trying to get our offense to do some of this. You saw like one of his threes was in a hundred percent because he had the ball. He passed into where his defender went to double team where, and it's like, where kicked it back. Leal's wide open. And it's like, that is, that's going to be there all season. Cause there'll be times where teams like, we can't, we can't, we, we, we want to double team where and it's like, well, then you're going to leave Anthony Leal open. And so it's like, I, there is a world where I do think some of this could be replicatable moving forward. Yeah, no, that's the thing. I, well, and that was, that feeds into the second point that I was going to make, which is that out of necessity, Mike Woodson had to change the way his team approached right. playing yesterday. And, you know, the, the stat that sticks out to me about this game, and I mentioned it on Twitter afterwards, they shot 22 three pointers. They shot as many three pointers as Iowa shot. They hit two more. And I'd like to note, Scott, that they won the game by six points, which if you take two three-pointers and multiply them by the points that you get for the shots, that ended up being the margin of victory. Um, this is a team that if you're going to take 22 threes and hit eight, you'll take that every day of the week. Indiana has to, moving forward, especially if Malik Renew is injured, but even if he's not, um, you know, with Khalil Ware being hobbled and also just with the way that this roster is set up right now, they have to become a bit more perimeter oriented. We've talked about this over and over again. Uh, the fact that they they shot those threes, it became part of the offense, just kind of made me wonder, like, what exactly was the reason why they haven't been doing this up to this point? And I think to some degree, this has to be incorporated more down the line. I mean, I still don't think that the offense looks great to watch, but there was at least the threat with those open threes, including that one that Gabe Cups made at the end of the game uh, that essentially kind of gave Indiana the final separation that they needed. Like there was a confidence level coming out of the shooters from three that you haven't seen. And that's the thing I hope that they can replicate with this. And, there, you know, so I'm going to let you talk about that. There's one other style of play aspect that I want to get to, but any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I hear you, my and I, I hope that's the case. My counter would be, as you look at this season, I haven't gone back and looked at like previous seasons. If you look at this year, like, you know, they, they go four for 15 against Harvard. They shoot 15 threes. The next two games, they only shoot nine going three for nine against Maryland and Michigan. It's like, you're shooting pretty well. You should have shot more. They didn't. You see these blips. Like, again, it's Northern Alabama, but they did shoot 24 against Northern Alabama and then kind of start dipping back down, only taking 12 against Ohio State. They went, you know, they shot eight for 24 against Purdue, very similar to numbers to Iowa. The next two games, they go six for 14 and 0 for nine. So now I will say, when you look at the trend, like the beginning of the year, they're kind of in that 10, 12 threes a game range. It is starting to tick up, but you do kind of see this, you know, 824 against Purdue. And then two games later, you're only shooting nine against Illinois. Some of that is the teams that you're playing. Some of it's schematic. 
But that, right. that's my only concern is you have seen these blips where they shoot a lot of threes and then you go two or three games later and they're not doing it again. Um, I, well, you, you hope that the confidence is there that, that makes it grow. Well, it's, and, and this is the thing that's important. It's not just the confidence, but it is the orientation of the offense. And, you know, so many complaints that we've voiced over the course of the season, and, and it's not just us, there's others as well, have been, why does it feel like the three-pointer is a shot of last resort for right. the offense? And it did feel like when when the chips were down yesterday that Indiana was starting to move the ball better out of necessity because they didn't have the crutch of throwing the ball in the post to Malik Renew to right. rely on. I think the trick, and hopefully Malik is fine and, and he'll be back in, in action soon, the, the trick is, can you leverage having Malik Renu, who's a really nice scorer in the post, he's got some great moves, you can certainly rely on him, but can you leverage the three-point shot as an offensive weapon and also to make it easier on Malik Renu to avoid the double and triple teams? I mean, I think if last night's game shows anything to me, it's that you can shoot the ball from three if you're Indiana and have some measure of success if you are serious about trying it. And I just don't feel like in the Illinois game, it does not feel like Indiana was particularly serious about shooting from deep. And that's how you get a situation where you only take nine threes for a whole game and you don't make any. And, and that has to affect the confidence of your shooters. Well, what stuck out to me in that Iowa game was how ready everybody seemed to be to shoot. And not all the shots were great. I mean, CJ Gunn had an air bulb three and, you know, there were a couple of threes that were way off, but Iowa had those two, you know, Peyton Sanford air bowled a three. There was yeah. another three that was way off. Like there's, there are lots of you're going to get those, but that that can't be a reason not to do that particular part of the offense. I I, I hear you. I'm not trying to be contrarian. I hear you. I'm just looking at the stats from last year. Like they go 10 from 20 for three at home against Ohio State. And then this is just attempted threes in the games afterward. This is last season. 11, 10, well, 12, 6, 11, 11. So like I, I, I hear you. Uh, my only counter is, uh, you know, all of last week, we're talking about how this needs to change. Like one game it did. We've seen these these blips go up. I the, the one thing about the confidence that I find funny, I was telling somebody this at halftime yesterday, is it's like I wish we could bottle and just talk to McKenzie and Baco and be like, you're playing the first four minutes of the game, the entire game. Because the first four minutes, every game, he comes out like an absolute stud. He shooting with, you know, with confidence, like he shoots great. And then, you know, maybe it's, he's on the bench too long. I don't know, but like the rest well, of the game, it feels like he's trying to reintegrate himself. And he had, he had one shot, you know, one three that was way off. And it's just like, that's the first four minute McKenzie is like the best possible McKenzie. It's almost like you, you don't want to take him out ever. Cause like, it feels like once he hits the bench the first time, it's like he has a hard time getting back to that. But anyway, well, no, I, it's a good point, and I think it's frustrating, and to some degree, it felt like one of the reasons why Iowa got back in the game. Yeah. I mean, there's coaching going on. Mackenzie and Baco's getting benched because Mike Woodson doesn't like what's happening with him defensively, and that's yeah, pretty he clear. Yeah, he left Stanford completely wide open for a three, and that's why yeah. he got pulled. And, and, yeah. and there's no question he's having bad moments defensively still, less, less than he was having at the beginning of the Correct. season, but still not good. But I think the problem right now is that you know, Woodson is doing what most coaches would do, which is, oh, you're going to screw up on defense. I'm going to put your ass on the bench. But the problem is that Mackenzie and Baco is having a real hard time reintegrating into the team and the game flow right. once that happens. And so, you know, you you it's a tricky one. And I don't envy Mike Woodson and the coaching staff on this because on the one hand, you can't just let blown defensive assignments go but on the other hand, this is a guy who, when he's properly engaged, is, is awesome. Is, you know, he's he's given he's he's had now seven, no six straight games in double figures, uh, offensively. And while that's not everything, realistically, Indiana needs those points because they have struggled to score the points that they need to be competitive in games. And he helped you drive to a fifteen point lead to start the game. So you know, you, you, this is where this is why coaches make a lot of money to try to thread that yeah. needle in terms of, of how you deal with a player like that is a really complicated thing. But what you talked about with the, the variance and threes, that is that happens with every team. Yeah. I think the other thing about last night's game that really stuck out was for the first time in a while, Indiana, honest to God, was awesome at offensive rebounding. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, they, they, they got rebounds on 38.2% of opportunities uh, on the offensive glass last night. That is the highest number that Indiana has registered since the Maryland game when they grabbed basically 43% of offensive rebound possibilities. And as we've talked about on this show, as I've talked about when I was on podcast on the brink, that is a potentially key component of the offense that has just not shown up. And, you know, part of it was yesterday. I mean, Khalil Ware just had a physical advantage over a lot of the people that were playing for Iowa, but it showed what the possibilities could be if you're dedicated to getting offensive rebounds. And it wasn't just McKenzie, or excuse me, it wasn't just Khalil Ware that was grabbing offensive rebounds. I mean, it was it was a collective effort. Um, you know, uh, Trey Galloway had an offensive rebound. Xavier Johnson had one. Mbako had one. Walker had one. Leal had one. There were, there were three team offensive rebounds. I mean, those things add up. They extend possessions, and they make it so that even if you're missing threes, it is possible to grab offensive rebounds. Like, it doesn't have to be an either-or situation. Well, and it's not even a size. I'm just going back to the Rutgers game. Like, we, you know, they out-rebounded us in the offensive glass 19-8, to eight, and they have nobody over seven foot. So, to, I mean, to the point, like, it's not just about there's no one to guard Cleo Ware. It's like Rutgers really doesn't have anybody to guard him either, and it didn't happen, and you also had a renew in that game. So I'm, I'm with you, and... and it goes down to, again, you don't get extra credit for effort, but it's good to see it. And a lot of it just came, a lot of those team rebounds and offensive rebounds just came down to effort and just came down to like the ball kind of got tipped around and, and we went and got it. And, and to be fair, like Iowa was giving effort too. They just, they out efforted. It wasn't like Iowa was kind of not going after things. We just out efforted them, which was really good to see. Yeah. Um, what else stuck out you, since you were at the game, I was watching at the upstairs pub. Uh, you were at the game. What else stuck out to you? I'm trying to, I not, I mean, not, not anything, not anything else that we haven't hit are already. I mean, I guess that the one thing I would say is just, it was looking back kind of interesting in a positive way, how unfazed this team seemed to be by the injuries. And what I mean is not that they don't care, not, they don't care about their teammates, but that that's, you know, Malik Renew is one of, if not the best player on this team and then goes out and they watch him hobbling around, like trying to get to the locker room. That was tough. That could have, they, they ended up, I think going on like a 12 Oh run after that. Um, it didn't seem to phase them. And like I said, in a good way and same thing with, you know, Xavier, Xavier goes down, the team's just standing there around him and they all kind of are doing that. Oh God, they have that look like, Oh gosh, the, you know, they could tell it wasn't good. And then that was when Iowa was in the midst of a run. So I just, I think seeing their reaction to, to those two things for a team that for the last couple of weeks, we've kind of been saying, you know, they're, they're making silly decisions. They're not seeming to be locked in or making, you know, less than stellar decisions on the court. I will say I was impressed seeing the, the kind of the, the mental aspect of this team, just being able to, you know, put that aside, segment it over and continue to play the basketball game. And very much a, you know, like I saw Anthony Walker go in for Xavier Johnson, just be like, all right, like I'm ready to go and like, just play basketball. And I think to me, that was impressive to see in person. That's good to hear. Now, I mean, and even on, on TV, I mean, most of the frustrations that people were having were just like, how is Iowa coming back in this game? I mean, but look, I mean, Iowa had two players that really played yeah. incredibly well. Uh, you know, you know, you're going to get Peyton Sanford. It's just like, Oh, good. We needed someone to fill that role of that Iowa guy. Yep. And you, everybody knows who that Iowa guy is. There have been that Iowa guys for like the last 40 years. Uh, and obviously Tony Perkins. Normally uh, Fran McCaffrey makes them, but yes. Right. No, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> Fran, Fran was like, you know, we're not, forget the OEMs. Like we're, we're going to do the, or no, we, I am the OEM. I yeah. Guess. Well, I guess 18 years ago, Mrs. McCaffrey was like, I'm out. Like I'm out. I'm right. not making any more McCaffreys for a while. Although there still is a McCaffrey on the team, but yeah. Um, but anyway, I, I think ultimately it's funny. Like there were a lot of flaws in the game and, uh, you know, Indiana just for whatever reason does not seem to possess the ability collectively to put opponents away. I mean, you can look yeah. at the entire span of this season and there's really not a single game where you feel like Indiana just won it comfortably uh i think the closest is probably the north alabama game uh but almost every other game on the raw on the schedule uh it, you know even the minnesota game a couple of weeks ago it was just kind of like well they won but it wasn't convincing yeah and maybe harvard but yeah i'm with you yeah 
Um, but, you know, in this game, you're going to get more games like this in the Big Ten than games where you're putting opponents away. And Iowa's a good enough team that, you know, I don't think you're just going to put them away automatically. So I was I was pleased to see that even though Indiana lost what had allowed them to establish possession of the game, they came back. They weren't phased by the injuries. They weren't phased by the fact that Iowa seemed to be hitting everything under the sun for about a seven or eight minute span. I mean, as as much of a momentum shift as happened in favor of Iowa for Indiana to grab it back down to with a minute 40 to play like that does. That's what Indiana fans have been waiting for. I think is, is something like this where, um, and we kind of saw it in the Ohio state game, but not quite. Cause like that was a game where Ohio, Indiana was leading that game. And then Ohio state came back and made it really close. This was almost like, yes, it was, it was a similar pattern, but in this one, it kind of felt like a lot more tenuous because of all the injuries, for Indiana to win this one felt a little more special. It was a game they absolutely had to have. Yeah. And it was a game that from a, you know, to be an underdog at home against a team that is not projected to be in the NCAA tournament right now is a real slap in the face, but it's also a very clear indicator of how far Indiana's stock has fallen based upon how they've played, based upon what the metrics say. And so it was really good to see them not just emotionally come away with the victory, but to some degree defy the analytics that have defined them so far over the course of the season by doing certain things like the three-point shooting, like the offensive rebounding, that they just hadn't really done as effectively up to this point. Well, also, I mean, the the end play, uh, you know, sometime in the second half, like maybe like 10 minutes to go or so, like the Gabe Cups got a pass in the corner and was wide open and kind of just looked at it and then didn't take it. And like the whole crowd was like, take it like take it take it. And he didn't he pass it off so it's it's nice kind of redemption that he's he's the one who hits the final three when he was like wide wide open um so there is some redemption to that so no but i'm with you that was a i mean what was interesting too is being there all i can say is you you can feel assembly hall like it it never got that crazy tense feel of like oh my god like we're about to lose this like it it did right. feel like the the crowd kind of kept getting back into it like there wasn't that like oh god like this is this is us letting it slip away, which you feel sometimes in those games. Like it, it the, the crowd was definitely there and it, it yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and you can kind of tell that on television as well. I mean, it's the, the assembly halls are pretty good barometer of these sorts of games. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting. You watch enough of them. You kind of get a sense of how they all filter in anyway. Um, Indiana with that win, they move back to 500 in the big 10 um, and they're kind of in an interesting spot right now in that they've got this game coming up against Penn State. We don't know. I think at this point, I haven't seen anything on Malik Renew. We haven't seen anything official on Xavier Johnson. It's very possible neither of those guys will be able to go. If you were going to have a next opponent that you had to face in, in that a location, it would be Penn State at Indiana. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, but it's uh, again, it's one of those things where Indiana, they're only a six point favorite uh, on Ken Palm. Uh, you know, and Penn State is kind of a a weaker version of Iowa to some degree in that like their their best virtue as a team offensively is that they don't turn the ball over. And what's going to be interesting is the one thing they really do good defensively is that they turn their opponents over. They're they're like 21st in the country and forcing turnovers. Uh, so it'll be an interesting challenge for Indiana in that game. I would expect them to win, even if they're missing both of those players. But I am interested to see how the minutes split out and how Mike Woodson and his staff decide that they're going to approach this from a game plan perspective. Uh, this seems like the perfect type of game to try to continue to build confidence from the perimeter. Uh, you know, so if, if Indiana can put a lineup out there, I mean, they're not facing the, the tallest player that Penn State has is is as uh, cute as Wahab who's you know, 6'11", but this is not a tall team by and large. This is a team that, um, you know, they're 178th in average height. Uh, Indiana is a significantly taller team than they are. So it's going to be interesting to see if Indiana kind of lowers their height at various positions because they don't have to focus entirely on matching physicality for physicality. So I am curious to see what happens in that one. But at this point, it's really more about can Indiana put it together with collective will and can they get scoring from the people that are going to be out there knowing Malik Renew might not be 
part of the roster that day. Yeah, I mean, you don't have must wins in January, but you do have them in February. So, you know, February 3rd, this is whether Malik Renew or Xavier Johnson are or are not playing or even how healthy Khalil Ware is like. This is a must win. You just you you cannot lose this game with what's facing you, what's facing ahead of you. You know, when you look at Penn State, they, they haven't won on the road this year. Um, so that that helps. They haven't been a great road team. They did beat Wisconsin at home, which is a, an outlier of sorts. But the, the only concerning thing with that game where Penn State beat Wisconsin is that Ace Baldwin, by the way, like top level name. Like if you want to have a shooter, name your kid Ace. Ace Baldwin and Zach Hicks together went 7-11 for three. And so yeah. that that's the concerning part is we still see this team. And, you know, Stanford with with Iowa, he's a really good elite three-point shooter. But we, this, this Indiana team has had an Achilles heel of letting three-point shooters get hot. It happens in Assembly Hall more than I would like it to. So that would be the concern is if either Ace – or Zach Hicks starts getting hot, you know, they they can shoot the lights out, and that's what you want to, you know, avoid against. And I do think the crowd might feel a little bit different if they get hot early. Suddenly you're down, you know, five or six to Penn State, and then it's like, oh, man, this is like that. maybe the, the crowd does turn a little bit. So that, that would be the concern, and that's where, again, back to our earlier point, you know, this is where if you're Woodson, it's just it's a tough balance because you have guys – on this team who sometimes just do blow defensive assignments, but you, you need their offense as well. You just hope they don't blow the assignments on Baldwin or Hicks giving up open threes. We'll see what happens. Penn state's going to try to push the tempo a bit. They've done that a lot so far this year. Uh, the one thing I'm hoping for Penn state has among the worst free throw shooting defenses in the country. Opponents are shooting 77% from the charity stripe. <laughs> Jokes on wow. them because we don't shoot well. So we'll Indiana, see. <laughs> man, if you want to talk about a get well game from the free throw stripe, that's Indiana needs that more You're than no anything kidding. else. Anyway, um, that'll be like, make sure to come see us yeah. at upstairs. That's kind of it for the game. Scott, you had a couple things uh, that we were going to chat about a little bit more next week, but um, just kind of some general program related items like what what you got for us yeah uh, that's just wow you're you're giving me the the wide open lane there just to drive and go nuts no i was you know i i listened to to your podcast last week and i think they brought up a lot of good things which we can kind of parse out as we continue going in i think you know a win a win while it doesn't solve everything it does help a lot and looking into a penn state game where hopefully you can get a nice win and then you start maybe making some better momentum is good the the one thing that i was thinking about is this like i got to come up with a better name but, you know, it's something you and Zach Osterman talked about, the idea of, you know, Crean's issues kind of cascades into Archie, which then cascades into Woodson. They, they all kind of compound. And I, I truly believe that as a fan who's lived through all of this, like my angst gets higher every year. As I was thinking about it, like I, I, I'm calling this like the happiness season index, but it kind of goes along with those same thoughts of, you know, like last year, for example was a good year. You know, like you you did win, you get fourth in the you know fourth in the tournament. You you got a protected seed which on the top level sounds good. But you know, last year was a year where we lost by 15 at Rutgers. Like we lost 3 in a row and I I mentioned it many times. Like we lost by 19 to Penn State and there was a moment there where it's like, "Oh my god, is this is this season going off the rails?" It didn't. But then you lost to Penn State in the Big 10 tournament. Like it was an uneven season that you can't say like that season. I had a great time the whole time. Like there were moments I was really concerned. And I started thinking along those same lines, like how many years over the last 20 years, have you had a season where it's just like, I felt great about that year. And like, so I, if you, if you, okay, that's, that's funny. I was, I was texting yeah. with a friend of the pod, Trisha Whitaker last night during the game. And I was like, all I really want is, a normal IU yeah. basketball team to root for like one year. And like, even last year, as, as, as good as that season was, it was just kind of like this weird arc where there were several points where you're just like, what is going on? And yep. um, yeah, no, I'm, it is funny. I, I, we think about that a lot in terms of like uh, happiness is in many cases anchored to consistency. Yep. And you can have Michigan state's a great example. Like you can have off years, where you're like, we're a seven seed in the tournament, but it's still a good year. And you still feel confident because of past performances that something's going to happen in the tournament down the line. It's not as pressure packed. Right. And what I think this is what adds up to it is like, again, last year, that top level, it's like four seed in the tournament. That's a great year, but there were moments that it wasn't. So I broke it down. Here are the years that just don't count. This is God is way too many. 2004, 5, 9, 10, 11, 14, 17, 18, 19, 21. We didn't make the tournament. So so none of those count as like 
at IU, we can talk about expectations. You don't make the tournament. That's not a good year. Like just a hard stop. I, I came up with three. I have three years in the last 20 and 20 is just an arbitrary. I just don't want to keep doing this forever. I have three years that I would say are good years. So I'll give you the three and then I, I have, I have reasons for all the other ones. So like, I'll just, you want me to go through it for fun? Yeah. So 2003, um, you know, go through it. There's a five game losing streak in the big 10, which also includes a Louisville game oddly. Um, and then you lost to Penn state to end the season. Um, so that wasn't awesome. 2006, you know, you fired Mike Davis at the end of the year. It wasn't a bad year. You go to the tournament, but you also lost at Indiana state. You had a five game losing streak, um, which included UConn at that point in the big 10. So those years don't count 2007. Okay. Um, I have it as a maybe because you know, you went five, four and five to end the big 10, but you did. You also had a first round loss in the big 10 tournament, but it it wasn't what I would consider an awful year. Um, you know, it's the first year with Samson, a new coach are kind of there. 2008 is just like, I, I have it marked as what could have been. Cause that's the second Samson year. And that is, that's a whole other podcast. I will just leave it at what could have been on that year. Cause things were trending well. And then something happened. Um, 2012, I have as possibly, um, that's the, that's the year we beat Kentucky at home with the watch shot. But that, as you've mentioned before, that's a year that we went two and five in the big 10 in January at one point, we were five and six in the Big Ten, but that was probably really close to being there. What's funny is 2013, everybody's like, oh, that was the year you're number one. It's got to be. Like, to me, actually, it wasn't because I remember we beat Michigan, we become number one, and then we immediately turn around to lose to Illinois in a really bad, like, last second play. And then it's like, we have a home game against Ohio State, which is good to win the Big Ten. We don't clinch it. Um, we lose to Wisconsin in the Big Ten tournament, um, you know. It's just like, anyway, it's like we have a second rank offense in the country and we get 50 points against Syracuse. Like that season is really hard to round as like a great year. Um, I'm taking too long, but I'll say the other one that (laughs) I I have as a probably is 2016. And I think you and I are in the same spot. That's the year with Yogi. They won the big 10. Um, You and I, I, I put this under, this is my neuroses. I just never fully believed it was actually happening. Like it had been so long. It's like, are we really going to, is this team, when's it going to punch me in the gut? They never did until they did lose as the number one seed in the big 10 tournament to Michigan. Um, but they never lost at home. They won the big 10. So probably 2016 is the closest, but like in 20 years, there's only three seasons that I have where it's like, that was probably an overall good year. And my, my larger point is like, I think this is what continues to build up the angst is even the years where you think like, Oh man, 2013 was good. It's like, it still was an uneven year. And well, again, as IU fans, we just were expecting more and more every year. So I hear you there in, in a way, but I think to some degree, I think the idea that there is a, a Nirvana of consistency so true with any top team is is kind of fictional and i mean even look at like purdue last year had a great season they were a one seed in the tournament they had a stretch where they lost four out of six and that was bookended by losses to indiana like uh but they had such a good year leading up to that i think you're going to have a lot of these kinds of things where there are swoons and i think especially in this era like so much of the the uh, you know we we tend to focus on the exemplars the seasons for schools where everything goes right and it's like damn we'd love to be those folks but realistically i think most programs will have games like that every two to three weeks and i think this was the case even when indiana was quote unquote like you know a a top-notch program in college basketball there were plenty of instances where indiana would lose a home game to a team that wasn't as good as them in the night era, you know, there, there, you see that with North Carolina, Tennessee, who's had a great season, just lost at home to South Carolina last night. I mean, there's, there's those sorts of things that happen. So I hear you. I think where with Indiana fans, where the problem is, is there's just not a lot of stacked successful seasons Yeah. where at the end of it, you know, it's like that stat that I unfurled the other day, where it's like, if you look at the, the reality of the situation, Um, over the course of the last 20 some years, Indiana hasn't made the tournament in, um, you know, in three consecutive years since 2008. Uh, you know, they, they, they made it, they made it back to back in 12 and 13. They made it back to back in 15 and 16, and they made it back to back in 22 and 23. And like that 
that will cause you to feel like everything is upside down very consistently. And so I think I'm, I'm a little bit less concerned with the ebbs and flows of an individual season. To me, I think after you get through a season, you can look back on it. And a lot of those, the, the peaks and valleys will even out. The problem is that, the baseline for those seasons for Indiana jumps so much. And you have a season like last year, which ends up, you know, kind of, it should have felt better than it did. And then you'll have other seasons like 2016 uh, that started off bad and everybody was waiting for the other shoe to drop and never did. You never fully get confident or comfortable with what the team is putting out there. And I think that is where, you know, for Indiana to have like a stretch, like Purdue's hat or whatever, you know, where you have, a couple of chunks of like five or six postseason appearances in a row, NCAA appearances in a row. Like that will cure that more than anything else. But I think that's harder now in college basketball because of how much roster movement there is, because of how many older players are still in the system because of COVID. Um, I, to some degree, it's almost like, do we need to recalibrate our expectations where the idea of making the tournament two, three, four years in a row? is hard for a lot of programs. Villanova might miss the tournament, you know, this year, North Carolina missed the tournament last year. Um, That's where Indiana missed all of the good times before the system changed. And now (laughs) everybody's got to get adapted to this new system where I think everybody's going to be up and down. No. And and your, your point is valid. Cause I went and look, I tried to look at the, did a little bit. I wasn't going to look at every big 10 teams every year. Like what teams have had, what I would consider a super happy season. It's, it's hard to find. I even went back in the Indiana archives And like, what was a great year, you know, obviously taking the national championship teams out because those are pretty good years. It's like the best I come up with was the 90, 91 team. That team lost at home to Ohio. They lost at Ohio state. They lost at home to Iowa, but they finished 15 and three in the big 10 went in the tournament as an NCAA two seed. Um, They didn't do well in the big 10 tournament that year. Didn't finish. Well, I'm just joking. There's no big 10 tournament. Um, That's, that's funny. Yeah. But, uh, but so, so your, your point is well taken. I think the other thing that is hurting not just the consistency, but, you know, the, the years that we've been good and had the spikes, um, you know, we haven't had the top level upline success. Like we've won two big 10 titles in those years that we were good, but, you know, half joking, but it's like, there's not a lot of other big 10 tournament success. And then not a lot of NCAA tournament success. Whereas like in 2013, if that team doesn't lose to Syracuse, and just makes the final four, th- that, that glow, I think, covers up a lot of the peaks and valleys as well, too. Um, you know, where you're, you're mentioning, you know, teams like Villanova, it's like, and I know you don't mean it this way, but it's like, you win a title, that covers up seven years. You can do a lot of mistakes between here and there, even a Final Four with this team. And I think that's what also is hurting, because even Purdue has had ups and downs, but they're consistently doing well in the Big Ten, winning Big Ten titles, winning Big Ten tournaments. And so last year, you know, wasn't a success for them, but they still won a Big Ten title, won the Big Ten tournament, um, you know, didn't be fairly Dickinson, but um, a- anyway, I, I hear w- exactly what you're saying. I just, my thought is that, you know, even the seasons that we would consider quote unquote good had moments of kind of more peril than just, Oh, we lost a game that sucks. Like we've had multi, you know, four or five game losing streaks or losing four out of six, even in seasons we consider good, which I think that just kind of helps stack the angst that Zach was talking about that goes year to year. And unfortunately just like, it's not, it's not getting dissipated at all. Like we got to, we got to have a season where we get to the final four to let the, the steam out, so to speak. No, I mean, look, ultimately there's nobody has felt consistently good about the program yeah. for like five years in a row in a long time. And that goes back to night. I mean, you know, that like the, yeah. you know, when the we last, were there, it wasn't we, awesome. No, I mean, people, there was a lot of like, Ooh, what's going on. Why? Like, is it time to hang it up? Should we move on? I mean, that's, that's been, that has been a constant state of the program for so long. And that and, was only five years removed from a final four and 10 years yeah. removed from a title. So, yeah. And, yeah. and so that's the nature of the beast. And, uh, you know, Indiana's had, there've been bad decisions. There's been bad luck. There's been a bunch of things that have filtered into that for older IU fans. They've got an idyllic picture of the past, yeah. which wasn't all puppies and roses, Um, But we tend to remember it that way because what's happened in the near past hasn't been very consistently good. And for younger fans, this is what they've been born into. Uh, You know, it is it is chaotic and it feels a lot of times like Indiana. If you compare them to the programs that have had consistent success in terms of wins, in terms of tournament appearances. I mean, it's not just it seems that they haven't measured up. 
Indiana hasn't measured up. Yeah. So that was my, you know, I think it was the hope when Archie got hired. It was the hope when Woodson got hired. Can there be some stability, not just of results, but can people feel good about the direction, the development, the, 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 you know, the, the way that the program sits within the larger landscape of college basketball. And that just hasn't materialized. And we'll talk more about that next week. Uh, this is a conversation as, you know, Indiana making the NIT is actually important for this program. I think like they need to do at least that obviously making the NCAA tournaments, what you want. The NIT is a poor substitute, but there has to be at least some level of consistency in terms of we're at least making the postseason, Right. So that's kind of what I'm looking at. And what do you get out of the remaining games? And so we'll talk about that more in the future. Um, but we need to wrap up now. Any final thoughts from you? No, I'm so excited for Saturday and looking forward to seeing whoever can make it down. Excited to see the new upstairs. Yeah, it's uh, it's wild. It's awesome. Looking forward to it. Thank you to Hard Truth Distilling. Looking forward to having them uh, sponsor us over there. And uh, we'll look forward to meeting up with all you folks as we host you at Upstairs alongside the fine folks at Upstairs. We'll be out there around 11 a.m. to noon and then all the way through the Penn State game and afterwards. For Scott, I'm Galen. This is Crimson Cast. We'll catch you folks on the flip side. Bring back the bison. So long, everybody.